Um, it's just an honor to be here today to, to introduce to you David Erickson. Um, I know we're running a bit low on time, but um, just wanted to say a few things. Uh, I'm eager to hear David speak about his areas of research, uh, including everything we have been discussing at this conference. Every, a lot of things will correlate. And um, David has been a leader in the collaboration between the Federal Reserve of San Francisco and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in bringing the health sector together with community development. Um, his book, The Housing Policy Revolution, was recently added to my top book to read. So I encourage <laughs> all of you to do the same. So please join me in welcoming David. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, this is uh, it's been super exciting to be here, and I've um, I've been spying on you for the last day because I've been in the elevator and whatnot, and it's just um, you just pr it, what's palpable is just what a nice group of people this is, and how it's sort of how much you like each other and know each other, and I thought that was really uh, evident in the award ceremony there. Um, I would like to just to mention that. Uh, uh, the comments that I make today are my own and do not re represent the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco or the Federal Reserve System because I say a lot of crazy things. Um, so appreciate that uh, at the get-go. And um, I was particularly excited to take to, to have this opportunity to talk to you because uh, because I I talk about these topics to a lot of um, to a lot of different groups, but uh, but I don't ever get a chance to talk to uh, to housers about it. Brian, can you do me a favor and hand me that? Thanks. And, um, and that's sort of my home. That was my first job. I, my first job out of, out of graduate school was uh, working for the California Housing Finance Agency. Um, and I did, um, I did uh, a permanent financing for affordable house for, for multifamily housing. And then I went on to do acquisition for low-income housing tax credits. Um, and I was terrible at both of those things. And so I ended up, I had to leave that field. Um, in part because my boss would always scream at me because I'm not a very good negotiator. Like I was always excited about the project and wanted it to get done, and so I just gave everything away right at the get-go, you know. <laughs> and so that didn't help. Uh, and uh, and the other thing is a bit of a daydreamer and not always a, 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 a kind of a detailed person, which of course, as you know, if you can make those deadlines and stay on top of those kinds of projects as they develop, you have to be really on top of things. And so. I thought, okay, I always sort of wanted to be a history professor, so I'm gonna go, I'll go back to college, I'll go back to graduate school and, 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 and work on that. And so I, um, I went to Berkeley and got a PhD in uh, American history, and uh, I found out I wasn't very good at that either. Um, <laughs> so that was a problem, <laughs> that was a bit of a problem. Um, but, what, but because I could read the sources and uses of funds, and I did understand American history, I thought, I'm gonna put those things together. You know, not a lot of people know how to do that. And so my dissertation, which became my first book, which uh, Spencer just mentioned, uh, was uh, on sort of the history of affordable housing finance in the United States in the 20th century. And so um, that was a really, it's just sort of an exciting experience because, um, or it was an interesting intellectual kind of journey because I kind of, I wrote, the, because I was younger then, I was mad at everybody and everything, you know, and so I thought I was really gonna, I thought it was gonna be a takedown because I thought it was too complicated. I thought it was too many moving parts. It was sort of this idea that you'd sort of um, create all these weird incentives. And I'm like, why don't you do it? If you know what you want, just pay for it, right? Is what I was thinking when I went into it. So the first, and, and so my first title of, of the dissertation that became the book was Nowhere to March, was this idea that like, because I felt like this, this is too, it's too in the, in the ether, you know, it's too, too confusing. And then as I studied what went on before in affordable housing finance, I sort of, I sort of began to, a, a, a new appreciation began to develop about what was going on with the low-income housing tax credit and the other tools in the toolbox. And, and this quasi-market that sort of creates affordable housing, this idea that you have um, uh, these groups that come together for a project, that it's competitive, and, and there's all kinds of really cool elements to this quasi-market, like for example, Nonprofits really kind of push on mission and really keep the sort of for-profit developers sort of honest. And for-profit developers really push the nonprofits on efficiency and really keep them sort of, uh, their kind of feet to the fire in terms of how they approach projects. And so there's some really sort of beautiful aspects to that sort of quasi-market that sort of, um, that builds affordable housing in this country. And, and the thing that I find just really remarkable, and people just don't, don't really have this um, clear in their minds. I was, I was quoted in the New York Times earlier this year about, I said the, the low-income housing tax credit is the best, the most successful social program you've never heard of. Um, 
And one of the things I think was really remarkable is that the number of homes that are, have been built under the low-income housing tax credit now outnumber all the homes built on, in all the programs dating back when the federal, to when the federal government got in this business in the first place, back in the 1930s. So um, that's a pretty remarkable achievement. Um, so I, so I, I, there's this appreciation of the quasi-market that's sort of been in, it, it's kind of now in my DNA, and I've been thinking about that for a long time over the course of my career. And another idea that's kind of, been, kind of came, introduced to me was this idea of health, and we were talking, we started talking about that this morning. Health is just sort of, it's such a, it's such a complicated concept because, I, so when I, I, um, I, uh, I'm gonna talk to the side of the room for a bit. So I, um, uh, when I, for most of my life, when I heard the word health, I thought medical care. Um, and, and this is something, you think I would know more, better than this because uh, my husband is a pediatrician and he teaches public health at UC Berkeley and uh, I would, you would think I would have a better sense of you know, the fact that the things that contribute to your health are more than just medical care, but I didn't really. And in fact, there's some really powerful studies that have been done over and over again that show that medical care contributes very little to your overall health. I mean, when something's broken, you definitely want it fixed, but in terms of what would cause your premature death, for example, it's really your social relationships, it's the environment you live in, it's the c community that supports you. Those are the things that really drive your health. And so it really was, that, that, that was a really, I, I, that was I've been a bit real learning journey. And, and one of the things that I'm now working on, and I'm working on a book now, and I want to share with you sort of some of the themes of that uh, in, in the next few minutes, is this idea of how can I kind of combine those two ideas um, in an effective way? And, and this is one of the, this is probably the only chance I'll ever get to say this, but what if we could create a new marketplace, a new quasi market that focused on well being and health? And you got an 8609 for, for a child ready to learn at kinder, kindergarten instead of successful lease up, right? What if we could somehow create incentives like that? And so that's what's been really inspiring me. That's why I feel like what you do is important. For, it's important to health. Housing is important to health. That, that, everyone's going to tell you that. That's now, that's not. What, what I'm telling you is something else, which is how you do it is really important to the future of improving health in this country, and I'll, and I'll get into that. So part of it is this idea about, um, so a population health business model, um, or what I call, sometimes call the market that values health. I think this is the concept that I'm trying to build in this new book, um, and uh, I, what, what the, 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 the way I like to explain it is to sort of talk about the building block ideas on how you get there, right? So I think there are four building block ideas to get to this market that values health. You guys kind of have it in already, because you understand if I say 8609 for ready to learn kindergarten, that's, that, that's kind of, I can shorthand some of that. But basically, the four building blocks, and I'll start with the first one, is around this idea about guardrails and airbags. And, it, and, and this comes from a, some, some, a, a very deeply personal sort of experience where, so, so, and I always feel a little odd talking about this in public, but anyway, my parents got divorced when I was very young. And um, it was, uh, divorce was not popular in those days, like it is now. Uh, they were the first on either side of their family to get divorced ever. And uh, it brought a lot of shame and despair and financial hardship to our family. And I can remember, I remember my mom sitting us down in her bedroom on a Sunday afternoon. And, uh, and I can remember just running my hand back and forth on this super ugly gold and uh, black uh, bedspread. And her just explaining, your dad's not coming back. And I thought, okay, well, now I'm freaking out. Like, I, I am a little kid. I don't understand what's happening. Um, I'm scared. And, um, and, then, uh, and then this showed up the next day. And, uh, so, and I can remember, I remember stepping on that step. It, it, this isn't the bus, of course. I didn't have to go back. But I, just, <laughs> I found this on Google Images. But it was a bus just like this. We, we used to call them pug nose buses. I don't know why we say that. But anyway, we would, we would, we, I walked up those steps. And the bus driver smiled at me. I knew her. She knew me. She welcomed me into that bus. She took me to a, to a school where the teachers cared about me. And immediately, I was plugged back into a system with some, with some um, structure. 
So that even though things were kind of falling apart at home, I was in a community that was supporting me. And, I, and it wasn't just my teachers. It was little league coaches and Sunday school teachers. It was the, I, the library was my home away from home. They sort of, the librarians kind of marched me through. I did all the dinosaur books and then the shark books. And then, then as I got older, the Roman history books. And so that, those, the, the library, the teachers, the coaches, the, 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 the neighbors, those were all what I call guardrails. Um, there were guardrails in my community. There were other guardrails in my community. We had a relatively affordable house that my mom um, was able to afford. Um, there was, it was a, we were in a low-income neighborhood, but, um, but she, had, she had a job. And, and so we had these things, housing, jobs, social uh, connections, and, and, and guidance. And those are the things I call guardrails, right? It's related to a concept that, um, that is uh, really uh, explained, I think, very well by Robert Putnam at Harvard University, who he talks, there's a book called Our Kids, and he talks about why is it that some, like, resource kids, middle income, upper, upper income kids, are doing so much better over time than low income kids. And the, one of the theories he has is that resource kids have gar, uh, airbags, rather. Um, airbags are different than guardrails. They, they, they deploy at the moment when you are sort of uh, in, in particular need. So, for example, if you are experiencing depression, an airbag would be to send, send your kid to counseling. Or if you're caught selling drugs or, or, uh, you, or you had an overdose, an airbag would be send you to a drug rehab program. And, um, and so what... what and these are the, you see these, these uh, uh, Putnam refers to as these scissor graphs. This one's a, a dollar spent on uh, childhood enrichment over time from 1970 to the present. And you see resource kids get more and more. Th that's a type of airbag as well. But he shows over and over and over again in this book examples where resource kids have those airbags that are deploying. And I guess, so, so, so one of the first sort of building block ideas for this idea about a market that values health or a population health business model is that Every kid everywhere deserves guardrails and airbags. And that's something that, we're going to, that, that we have to work on. The other piece is community development. And this is something that I often talk to groups that don't know what community development is. You do, but I'm going to go through some of these examples, talk to you a little bit, but sort of a health um, angle to this work. So this is an example. This is the Solara Homes in Poway, uh, California. What's, um, the, 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 I just, uh, for, for your purposes, because you know what affordable housing is, uh, the, I, I highlight one of this, this project in my book in part because it really gets at when I was interviewing one of the uh, tenants. She said, you know, what, you know what I love about this? What I love about this apartment is that when I order a pizza, they're not afraid to deliver it to me. And it's just, it's just palpable, the pride that she feels about living in the beautiful, a beautiful low-income housing tax credit apartment. That translates into better health. This is a project in San Francisco. It's the Plaza Apartments. It's for people who are formerly homeless. And what, what's really powerful to me about this, and I was interviewing a nurse practitioner who worked at this project, is that she was explaining how, so this is a project, so uh, San Francisco is a city and a county, and so um, oftentimes the money, that you, as you know, the money that's available for affordable housing development is really runs through cities. Oftentimes the money that is spent on um, indigent um, uh, medical care, for example, it runs through counties, to the county hospitals. But in, in San Francisco, they're, they're, they're both the same thing. And so what was, uh, a, 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 I think, a stroke of real genius was an effort to try to spend more money from the county's medical budget to start spending it on housing in order to save money in the emergency department to stabilize some people who were formerly homeless. This is one of the examples that was paid for with that project. But what I liked about this project, and I was interviewing the, the nurse practitioner because it has medical offices, yes, but it also has offices for case managers, for, um, for uh, coaches and navigators and others to help people who are formerly hom homeless get back, their lives back on track. But the, the, the nurse practitioner was explaining to me this one moment where she was saying how it was end of the year, they're having a holiday party. Um, she had brought in a... Um, a karaoke machine, <laughs> and there were all these like all these people who were formerly homeless. They were all sort of sort of sharing their famous, their favorite, you know, '80s power ballad that they were singing, you know, in this group in the community center. And I, and and she said it was the first time that this group had ever really experienced community. You know, that they had, and we know that adds to your health. That is what makes you a healthier person when you feel supported and accepted by the community you live in. 
Now, this isn't housing, but it's just, just, to, just to round out some of the things that community development does in terms of uh, their investments into children. Uh, this is a knowledge is power program uh, 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 school in Washington, D.C. But what I think is really powerful about this is that there are two messages that are sent to the child that walks through the doors of this building. One is that you live in a society that cares about you, and two, you also live in a society that expects a lot from you. It's a powerful message you send to a child. And as we know, through things like the Perry Preschool and the Abyssidarian Project and others, when children get a very strong start in life, whether it's preschool and early, early uh, elementary school, even if, they're, even if the cognitive skills fade, right, even if their test scores begin to sort of fade in later years, they are twice as likely to be married, earn more, half as likely uh, uh, to be in prison. Lots of things flow from that self-esteem that comes from a kid having a really strong educational experience in their very early years. And we know too, and this is, this is a project in Houston, um, it was it d developed by the Baker Ripley, um, it was a former settlement house that became a, a, a community development corporation, but what you, you, uh, it's hard for you to see perhaps in this, but there's, there's, a, there's a bank branch, there's a, there's a credit union, there's a legal aid office, this is an area of mostly immigrant uh, folks in this community. But what we would also know are household financial well-being is a really powerful contributor to your future health. If you, if you, the, the idea about don't cry over spilt milk, you cry over that milk if you spill it and your kids are going to go hungry that night. So if you can make sure there's a bit of a cushion, if you can make sure the household has some kind of financial uh, uh, cushion, that that adds significantly to future health. And this is my last slide on community development work, and this is, this is a project in, uh, in, in San Diego. Um, it's uh, commercial development with New Marcus tax credits, but it's, uh, what's interesting about it to me is that, that, that most of the people who live in this area are from southern Mexico and have real pride in their uh, Mayan heritage. And so you can see that the design here is really mimicking the, 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 the temple complex in Palenque and the Yucatan Peninsula. So it powerfully sort of reflects the community that, it, it, that it's serving. Um, it also uh, has a grocery store in what was formerly a food desert, um, and it's got an amphitheater so that that community can come together and, 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 and bring, bring their conversations together about how, what, they, what they hope for in their community, celebrate their culture, celebrate their community there. Um, an interesting twist on this one, by the way, is uh, there was a way in which the community could buy into this project. They, the, 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 the state set up an apparatus where they could actually buy shares, like equity shares in the project. And so when, when they were first talking about the project, they were basically saying, well, we want, uh, we want to make sure that this new project reflects our values and our culture, and we want to make sure with a bunch of mom and pop shops are really sort of treated fairly, and that we, sh you know, uh, that we have local people participate in, in this development. And then when they were equity owners, they were saying, yeah, we want Starbucks and McDonald's, and like, we want a cash flow here, because we want this place to go to be successful. But what I'm trying to, so, so that, so that the, the second building block idea is community development as a contributor to health, right? And that's something I think that is really beginning to be well understood. Um, and the scale is big. So we know, so the uh, National uh, Association of Affordable Housing Lenders just did a study with um, the Urban Institute on sort of the dollar amount, and they estimated it's $400 billion a year. Is, is invested into low-income communities through the tools that you know. So I'm not gonna go into much detail about all of those. But that's really significant. But that pales in comparison to where I think we really could go next, which is the third building block, which is this idea that community development needs to start partnering with health to make investments in those upstream social determinants of health that provide early childhood enrichment, that build community, that provide you the pride that you get in living in a decent, affordable home. These are the things that we're starting to see the health community invest with the community development community in, in, in a really powerful way, and that's the third building block of this concept. And so one example is uh, it, Dignity Health, uh, is a formerly Catholic healthcare system of the West, has a $300 million fund where they invest primarily through CDFIs, Often in affordable housing, but another this is a this is an incubator uh, job incubator facility uh, or, or, or organization in San Francisco called La Cocina. But it um, 
And it's very interesting, by the way, because there are lots of nuns on this. I'm on their advisory committee, and there are lots of nuns on it as well. And it really is kind of like this Mendelian sort of um, genetic experiment. Like, when you cross a nun with a real estate developer, you get a real estate developer. You know? Because um, they're like, well, who's got site control? What's going on? You know, they're very aggressive. And I was like, wow, you guys are good. You would have been very good as an affordable housing lender. Um, but... Uh, there are lots of examples like this. So there's, this is the Healthy Futures Fund, $300 million. This is through the Morgan Stanley. Uh, it's, this, this money is subsidized by the Kresge, Kresge Foundation. It's operated through um, uh, LISC, is, the, is, is also uh, the, sort of the architect behind this. And it, it, it is, you have access to this money, and it's for affordable housing and for clinic development. But you have to d demonstrate some kind of social determinants of health strategy in order to get access to this money. So in this case, this is the Conway Center in Washington, D.C., and what, in order to get the clinic money, you have to demonstrate that you have, you have adopted the whole neighborhood as the patient, right? And just to, just, just to march through that really quickly, in this place, they, they provide medical care, for sure, but they also do job training for neighborhood residents to get into the medical field, those two white tower t buildings on top, of the, uh, on top of the red area, that's affordable housing. 100 units on one side is for people who are formerly homeless. The other 100 units are for families. It's near transit. It's near a lot of opportunities. This is a project that really is sort of demonstrates how community development can promote health and adopt the whole neighborhood as the patient. Another example is LISC and uh, their partner Prometica in Toledo, the Toledo area, the northwest area of Ohio. Um, where they have a $45 million fund where they are co-investing with banks, where the medical center is co-investing with banks on the upstream social determinants of health. The first projects through that system have been, have been affordable housing. And this is an interesting project. It's an equity fund, so it's a little bit different. And it's uh, in Boston. It's the, the idea is um, it's the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund. And it was motivated, one of the co-creators of this project, uh, uh, her name is Maggie Superchurch, which sounds like an awesome name, you know, Maggie Superchurch. Um, but it's, uh, I thought she had hippie parents, but she went to Yale and she was a, she was a captain of the fencing team, so, and uh, she does not have hippie parents. She, her name was Maggie Super, and she married Bruce Church. But anyway, she, um, <laughs> Superchurch had this idea. She said, look, why can I invest in a company that makes a pill that lowers blood pressure, but I cannot invest in a neighborhood that does exactly, medically, exactly the same thing. And so she started this fund based on that, to answer that question. You can buy into her fund, and you, she said, I will deliver you results on improved health, and she keeps uh, statistics on the health of the areas where they do their investment. But the, 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 the idea here is an equity fund so they can move faster, because the, the, the effort here is to try to get ahead of the gentrification displacement pressure uh, that's being br um, brought about by the expansion of their uh, light rail system, so into s sort of low-income areas. And so, uh, we, we have a similar program, an acquisition fund in San Francisco, uh, and the two main uh, investors are Citibank and what was formerly Catholic Healthcare of the West, Dignity Health that I just mentioned. Kaiser Permanente is interesting. They are um, the head of, it used to be, doctors used to say, look, we don't ask questions about your social circumstances because we can't control that. So the patient comes in with asthma, you give them a pill, you send them back out, they're in an environment that exacerbates the asthma, they come back in again. It's just inane that they thought they could do that, right? Eventually, so Bernard Tyson, he's a, he's a physician, he's CEO of Kaiser Permanente, he says, look, we co-own the problem. It's not just medical care. We co-own it. We, we own those people's social circumstances as well. And so you're starting to see that mind shift, that co-ownership in the health sector and one way that's manifesting is Kaiser is investing $200 million in affordable housing through enterprise community partners. Um, they're doing a big emphasis on uh, a homelessness in Oakland, where their headquarter is. But it's, it's just another example of how the health sector is coming together and, and, and partnering with the community development sector to try to improve those upstream social determinants of health. Now, I just went through five examples of this. Um, in the old days, there were only five examples. Now I, have to, I keep it to five because they're, they're 50 and I, I'm running out of time, but that's just, just to illustrate because I want to get to the last building block. The last building block is, gets back to the 8609 ready to live, learn at kindergarten idea. Can we take the quasi-market that we've used to build real estate in, in low-income communities or and all over in the United States 
and apply that quasi-market to some kind of a health outcome. And I think this is the inspiration, I think, for this market that values health is the affordable housing finance uh, 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 industry. So in, that, in this marketplace, there are buyers. And the buyers, in my mind, are the two big ones are the medical care, the medical sector, and the money we spend on anti-poverty work downstream. So, so these, to me, are the twin revolutions that are really we are in the midst of. They're very hard to see. Revolutions are hard to see when you're in them, right? So um, the term industrial revolution was not used until 150 years after the steam engine was, was developed. Like, when you're in it, you don't see it, right? So I think we're in it. Um, I hope we see it soon, and I think we will. But one of, the, one of the revolutions is this idea that we spend $3.6 trillion last year on medical care. 85% of that is on chronic disease. Most chronic disease is avoidable, and most chronic disease that's avoidable is generated in low-income neighborhoods. So to me, like, that's interesting that we have spent $400 billion a year on the things that we care about through CRA and other mechanisms, but I'm more interested in that trillion dollars being spent upstream to make sure those problems didn't develop in the first place, and those diseases didn't develop in the first place. Type 2 diabetes is not an incurable can uh, illness, it's totally avoidable. So let's figure out how we spend that money upstream. Uh, there's about a, this is the part where me sort of distancing myself from the Federal Reserve is important. Uh, so we spend a lot of money on things like job training. I love the idea of job training, right? Um, but the problem is that it's very hard to retrain somebody for a job when they weren't properly educated in the first place. So better to spend those billions of dollars that we spend downstream on job training on making sure every kid arrives at kindergarten ready to learn and every kid graduates from high school with the skills they need to learn a new job when they lose one, right? So th these are the kinds of shifts that we're going to start seeing, I think, when we start moving to outcomes-based financing in our social service sector. That's, that's probably another trillion dollars a year that I think can be repurposed for upstream work. Lots of other categories in this buyer category. So for example, healthcare, um, or, or health insurance, for example. So United Healthcare, Fortune 10 company, is, spend, is, is providing, they, they were buying the low-income housing tax credits for a long time because they believe in affordable housing as a driver of health. They don't, even, they don't even deal with the affordable housing, the light tech market anymore because they feel like they're priced out by the, the CRA-motivated banks. They just make direct loans to CDCs to just acquire and rehab housing. So in, in, uh, in Phoenix, they have, uh, they have provided a $22 million, like, very low-interest loan to Chicanos por la Causa, the CDC there, to, um, to build affordable housing to house the policyholders they, that they have through their, through their administration of the Medicaid program in Arizona. So that's an example where just a health insurer is directly investing in housing. Um, there are other buyers, the Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Kresge Foundation, Health Conversion Foundations, uh, lots of community foundations, lots of organizations that are willing to put money into to better health outcomes. Um, so if there's, these trillions of dollars ready to land, they're ready to, so they, they want to buy better health, they want to buy better well-being, how do they do it? Well, they have to go find producers or sellers, all right? Does any market has a producer or seller? So who's a producer of health? You guys are. You're producing health. Like, you, the fact that you pr give someone a job to build a house, the best, one of the most important determinant, uh, social determinants of health is having a living wage job. The fact that you, the best predictor of future health for a child in elementary school is not their body mass index or any other medical uh, 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 test that you can do. It's whether or not they're reading at grade level. And one of the biggest determinants of whether or not they read at grade level is housing stability, because finishing the school year in the school that you started is absolutely critical to staying on target as, uh, in, your, in, in your reading capability. So as housers, you are producers of health. That woman who is, a, who is proud to, feel, to live in her house because it's a beautiful place to live, that produces health. The fact that in that, in that formerly homeless community where they are built, the formerly homeless uh, uh, um, uh, uh, supportive housing project, the Plaza Apartments, that they're building community, that produces health. And so the work that you're doing is, is absolutely doing that. 
Now, having a child at term is critical. Having all kinds of support in terms of your parenting is critical in the early years. The zero to five period we know is when the brain does its, most of its wiring. So having an engaged strategy for those children is really important. Therefore, preschool is a producer of health. Reading at grade level, as I mentioned, is a producer of health. Therefore, teachers are producers of health. You can see where this is going, right? Having an adult outside of your parents who cares about you and cares about your future, that is one of the best predictors of future well-being and health. And so there are lots of people in this producer category that are ready to produce better health outcomes. We just have to find a way to connect the producers to the buyers, right? Now, one of the ways to do that are through things like the Healthy Futures Fund and the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund. Uh, another way to do it is with, um, you have uh, population, uh, you have places where somebody owns most of the downstream medical care cost risk. So um, we were talking before that the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve uh, System, not just, the, not just the San Francisco Bank, but the Philadelphia Bank and, and the Cleveland Bank, the district that you're in, um, have been big participants in this partnership with Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, focusing on the sort of uh, ways in which the health sector can work with the community development sector. Our next meeting is in Honolulu in three weeks, which I'm very excited about. Um, but uh, Hawaii is very interesting. Hawaii was a place that was formerly a plantation economy. They grew uh, uh, sugarcane and pineapples. They don't do that anymore. And it's having a really rough transition in that sense. Um, and so it is like many uh, Rust Belt cities in, in, in this area where you sort of finding a new economic reason for being has really been tri tr trying and traumatic for them. Um, and it's interesting in Maui, for example, the island of Maui, is now uh, Kaiser Permanente now uh, operates all the hospitals on the island and has about half of the population are policyholders. So in a way, Kaiser has about 80% of the downstream medical care cost risk. And once they figure that out, they start talking to preschools because they started saying, look, we want every kid to have a totally engaged childhood so that they, because we know that'll save us money in the long run, right? So are there little Maui's in Pennsylvania? That's my question. Are there counties, are there rural counties with one health insurer? Are there company towns? Are there any places where you can find somebody to say, look, we can save you money on medical care cost risk uh, if we are to, if you partnered with us and our other allied partners to create neighborhoods that promote health. Um, another connector are these, uh, uh, there's a series of uh, sort of pay for success financing mechanisms. We've heard a lot about the social impact bond, but there's tons of others. Uh, there is uh, a book we did with the nonprofit finance fund called What Matters Investing in Results to Build Strong, Resilient Communities. We're gonna have a conversation about that at the Philadelphia Fed on May 22nd. Jimmy Gessner, are you in, where are you? I thought I saw you over here, here in the back. So if you have, if you, if you'd like to attend this conference, uh, talk to Jimmy, rising star in the community development function at the Federal Reserve, um, but we do, we're having this conversation uh, in Philadelphia in, in a couple of weeks. But the idea here is that there are many tools, because I get it, like you can't like, you can't stop paying for the dialysis for the type two by diabetic. It's not like that trillion dollars that I just mentioned in, in avoided medical care costs is sitting on a shelf somewhere. Like you're gonna have to use some kind of tools in order to get you there, but there are lots of ways to do it. There's 500 pages worth of them in this book. So I encourage you to order a free copy of that on in, in investinresults.org. And I just wanna do a quick recap of this. I mean, the, the building block ideas to me are guardrails and airbags. Everybody deserves that. That there is a quasi-market for community development. That, it's, the, the things that you build, the things that you work on, promote health. But more importantly than that, it's how you build them, I think, is a model for how we can do this for health outcomes and human capital outcomes as well. Um, we've seen this. Th there, there is only going to be more co-investing from hospitals and banks and, and their allied partners, CDFIs and insurance companies, et cetera, in the upstream social determinants of health. And I think all of these things are building towards this future where we're going to have significantly more resources to improve the upstream social determinants of health and where every kid has an awesome life, gets into adulthood with the tools they need, and really can thrive as adults. So thanks very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. 
A lot of the projects that um, you've highlighted are in urban areas. Yeah. Um, a lot of the country is very rural. Yeah. Um, translating some of these projects from urban to rural is a challenge for those of us that live in those rural areas. Do you have any suggestions? So, so I, um, there's, this, there's this term in Arabic uh, that change comes from the periphery. You know, there's this idea that like the, the prophet, there's the, 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 tr the Jewish tradition of prophets, you know, that talk about that would kind of rail against the existing system. We're always kind of, um, you know, running the risk of, of, um, of uh, retribution. And so, um, and, and that's true in Islam as well. And uh, so the people who had kind of challenged the system were always kind of outside the city walls, you know. And I've always thought that like rural, that's, I feel like the rural sort of community is really in a position to make this jump quickly and in a way create the model that the cities will follow. Because oftentimes in the rural environment, one, there's usually very few people who, very few entities own the downstream medical care cost risk. So you can figure out who that is pretty quickly. Oftentimes, the medical system, the hospital, is the biggest employer in those places. Um, and they can use all kinds of anchor strategies and whatnot to sort of intervene. And you can, when you think about a way, a, a, a really coordinated way to create a, a community that promotes health, you can get everyone around the table because you can actually get them around the table. So I feel as though that there's some elements there, even though there are fewer foundation dollars per person in rural areas, even though a lot of times those places get overlooked in terms of whether or not there's a banker wet, ready to sort of make the transaction. There are lots of disadvantages that I totally get, which is I think where your question was coming from. But what I'm trying to say is I think there's some advantages in this market that values health for rural areas. That's where I feel like Maui might be, it, it, there might be an example there that to sort of say, it would be just really interesting to sort of in a rural area, just get everyone together and say, look, who, who, who is paying for the medical um, care consequences of not having a, a healthier community? And let's figure out how we can engineer a, a, a more healthy place and figure out who to pay for it. This, is that helpful? Well, you're giving me like this very harsh stare. So I'm like, I am not like, I'm not feeling like I'm good. <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. I'll talk. But I do, think, I do think there's lots of opportunity for rural. And I would be very interesting to partner with the USDA and some other sort of big players that really care about rural to sort of really think this through. And I'd love to, I'd love to host something like that, maybe have it at like the Kansas City Fed or something where we could sort of really dig into it. Sure. So the question was about uh, aging in place for seniors and how that plays a role. So it's really, it's really powerful in terms of things like, the thing, once you start getting a cash flow going, I think really exciting things can happen. So for example, uh, and I'm dealing this with my own, my mother and my aunt who live in, I have a house in Palm Springs, but they live in it, so it's not as glamorous as it sounds. But um, it, there's all kinds of technology in terms of things like bat, sensing bath mats and gait analysis and other things that are really c capable now in terms of kind of better case managing and whatnot. And uh, keeping, keeping them, keeping uh, seniors healthy and aging in place and, in a, and out of the emergency department, the minute, like my aunt fell in the shower not too long ago, she, she had to call, she had her medical alert, she had to call, you know, the, uh, the emergency uh, uh, responders came, took her to the, the medical, uh, took her to the emergency room. That was like $8,000. Like you think about the cost, like every time something like that happens. So, so I think a very supportive environment for seniors is really uh, possible and a, and a real cost savings to the medical care system. And so I think there's, um, there's absolutely a partnership available there. Yeah. Okay. And I think, I think I'm getting the red card. So I think that means I'm going to be kicked off. So I think this is the last question. Okay. Uh, this is, this is very uh, fascinating and powerful. Do you have a strategy that you can suggest to motivate the key players, the stakeholders, to want to get around the table to start the discussion? It sounds like certain players need the aha moment to say that, yes, uh, we, we need to think this through. We need to re rethink how we've been doing business. 
So I think, I think organ hopefully this book will be done over the summer, so I, 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 that might be helpful as a little bit of a roadmap. But um, I think it would be helpful to organize in terms of um, the producers of health. And part of the reason, like, I, I wasn't just pandering to you when I said I thought you were nice people because you're talking to each other in the elevator. Like, I'm from San Francisco where everyone thinks they have the right answer, and it's, you can't get anything done. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, it's just, and here I just find, like, in places, like, I, I'm just getting a sense here that, like, if you could get together with other, LM, other people who you think can promote health, so housers, educators, um, public safety, think about the people you could sort of, in your community that you could say, you know what, a lot of cost for this hospital system is being driven by these two zip codes, and we've got a plan to make those zip codes a lot better and a lot more health promoting. Who could we pitch that? First, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that with those people who live in those places, too, of course, because we want to make sure that there's, this is a strategy that, that the, the residents are on board with. And then pitch it to somebody. Like, who owns that medical care cost risk? I mean, is it, is it the emergency department of the local um, county general hospital or something like that? I mean, I think that's a good place to start um, to figure out who owns the downstream medical care cost risk and then figure out a strategy to save that entity or entity's money. And that's where I feel like some of these conversations can get started. Um, I'm cutting into your break now, so now I feel bad about that. So listen, thanks. I know, I know we're going to have a, a breakout on this topic um, in, the next, uh, in the next session, so I uh, hope to see some of you there to have more in-depth conversations. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Thank Brian. Thank you, uh, Dr. Erickson. That was very uh, enlightening and, and for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Another round of applause. Thanks very much. You, you touched on some very uh, topics that are near and dear.